Good afternoon and welcome to the IQ Geo Group PLC investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and public responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Richard Petty, CEO. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so we've got a very interesting presentation for you today. Um, uh, five chapters uh, that we uh, think will cater for everyone, whether you've uh, invested in us before or heard about us before or not. Uh, so we have an introductory chapter that gives you an overview of what, who we are and what we do. Um, Heywood will then take you through some key financial highlights. Uh, we want to talk to you about industry drivers and the global opportunity uh, that uh, we are looking at. Uh, we'll take you through our product uh, and go-to-market strategy. And then uh, we have uh, in, to close with uh, more information about our financial performance. So the, the run-through will take about 45 minutes. So we hope to have uh, 15 minutes at the end uh, to take you through um, our questions. So I'd like to start uh, with a, a couple of slides uh, introducing us. Uh, so uh, first and foremost, we're a software company. Uh, and uh, we operate in two verticals, which are telecoms and utilities. And uh, we're all about helping network operators in those verticals uh, build better networks. Our unique selling proposition is that we provide an integrated software solution to help these network operators plan, build, and manage or operate these networks in a single integrated solution. And uh, in uh, slides throughout this presentation, we'll tell you more about that uh, very important position. Uh, by way of introduction to the company, uh, I'd like to tell you that first and foremost, we operate uh, globally. Uh, so this is uh, a global market. We sell the same product uh, around the world. We operate in three main regions. Uh, the first is North America. Um, North America is our biggest market. Uh, the majority of our revenues come from uh, US and Canada. And uh, as you would expect, uh, we also have our largest offices in North America, uh, primarily in Denver. Uh, where we have about uh, 60 people. Uh, our second most important region uh, is uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, we're headquartered in Cambridge uh, there, but actually our largest commercial operation is run, is office is run out of uh, Belgium. And uh, this came to us uh, via an acquisition uh, of a, a product line called Comsoft. Um, but that, that office uh, now acts as a single point of sales marketing implementation for the entire EMEA region. Out in APAC, uh, we have an office in Japan, uh, which uh, we've had uh, for many years and through which we've, we've achieved excellent levels of market penetration in, in, the, in, Jap in Japan. And last year, at the back end of last year, we opened in Kuala Lumpur, uh, which we think is a better base for going after all of the opportunities that are emerging uh, in that part of the world. Uh, we see very significant investments in fiber rollouts in particular, and uh, Kuala Lumpur is a much better base to go after all of that. We're very pleased to have over 500 customers now, um, and uh, these are around the world, and these customers span from the very largest telco and utility operators in the world to really quite small operators, um, private network operators like uh, universities and um, uh, hospitals and airports, um, and small uh, utilities like small city level water grids and small cooperatives. So we, we, we span the whole range. Um, but the nice thing about having 500 customers is that uh, it, it, uh, it means that we have a large captive audience to sell and upsell to. And uh, one of the things we'll talk about in terms of our financial profile is how, our, how the mix uh, between revenue coming from existing customers and um, uh, versus revenue from new customers is now is now shifting. We have over 100,000 users uh, who use our product day in, day out. We, we are a mission critical application. Um, and so the product has to be performant, it has to be reliable, it has to be secure. 
And today we have over 300 staff and subcontractors. So um, we do compete against much, much larger companies, but we're able to do that because of our uh, vertical focus. So because all we do is networks, uh, it means that we've been able to accumulate the experience, the expertise and the staff uh, to do very well within these verticals against uh, companies that are much larger than us and have much bigger organizations and, and bigger balance sheets. Um, but by focusing on just these two verticals, it means that uh, now uh, we are viewed as uh, functional leaders, as performance leaders, um, and we've developed a product that has real competitive advantage uh, compared to really all the players in this market. And um, that that competitive advantage is now apparent through the very consistent results that we've achieved over, over the last three years. We, um, uh, we also um, operate uh, through channel and we have a very strong channel presence, for example, in Japan. Europe is uh, what, what we term a hybrid market. So we operate directly and via channel, uh, particularly in the Middle East and Africa. And in the US, uh, because we have such a direct presence, we do quite, quite a limited amount through channel, but uh, that will grow over time. And the last uh, differentiator I'll mention here is that um, uh, the product is uh, cloud native. And that again is a competitive differentiator to our products, uh, our competitors, most of which are, are pre uh, cloud technology. Um, and so that gives us real advantages in terms of performance, scalability, and the ability to support customers in regions where we do not have a direct presence. Okay, so I'm going to just look at the, uh, the history of IQG and some key milestones. So uh, we, we started in 2019 as IQ Geo, so it's the fifth anniversary of, uh, of the sort of the geospatial part um, coming from the, the original Ubisense business. Um, and you can see here the in orange, the number of customers and the growth in those customers, and also in green, the growth in the number of employees. So we've seen significant growth over the last five years. Um, a few other points. Um, we acquired OSP Insight in uh, December 2020, and that gave us access to the, the, the they specialize in the fiber market at the tier, what we call the tier three, tier four end of the market. So that's the small private network operators that Richard has just described. In August 2022, we also acquired Comsof, which was based in Ghent, and that gave us two things. It gave us a best in breed automated fiber planning engine that allows us to start right at the beginning of a, of a fiber rollout and help our customers to plan their, their fiber rollouts. And it also gave us a significant presence in the European region with about 60 customers. So prior to this, we were mainly North America with a, an operation in Japan, but quite small in Europe. And now we've got a good operation in Europe and we've been really successful, not only with the Comsoft product and expanding sales of that in regions outside of Europe, but also taking the IQGO uh, product to customers in Europe. So there's been a good amount of cross-sell and upsell. And I can come on to that in, in due course. A few other points to note is, you know, we've really accelerated the launch of new products. Um, so in 2023, we had the first Comsoft and IQGO uh, integrated on the same platform. We've launched what we call our addition strategy. So this is taking our IQGO code base and, and wrapping it up at the lower end for the tier three, tier four end of the telco market, um, a sort of a, a multi-tenanted SaaS uh, product that is sort of non-configurable and it's really out of the box, really easy to deploy, just requires a little bit of training. And then we've also launched in 2023 our, what we call our adaptive grid solution for the utility uh, customers that we have. In terms of our commercial model, uh, our main go-to-market um, offering is a software subscription where we sell on a per seat, per module basis, and we can do that for the majority of our, of our products. We also sell perpetual or term licenses, which come with 20% support and maintenance, and this is mainly favored in the North American utility market, um, as some customers in, in various states do not have the ability to pass on OPEX to their end customers, um, and they still favor a CapEx purchase, um, purchasing method. So we do sell those term licenses um, in that region. Um, for the Comsoft product, which, is, as I've said, is the automated fiber planning engine, 
we sell it on a, uh, a, a consumption-based um, model, which is called a demand point. A demand point is a home or premise that the software is used to plan for. So say if a customer is rolling out fiber to 1,000 homes, they would they would want to plan 1,000 homes, and therefore they would buy 1,000 a, a demand points, and we'd charge it on a demand point basis. So I'm just going to take you through some key financial highlights for the FY23 year, year end. Um, all the green boxes at the top there, I'll explain over the next few slides. But one point I just thought I'd make right up front is our, our net retention rate of 133%. That's actually an average across the group um, at the enterprise level. So the big um, tier one, tier two level customers, we actually achieved about 140% net retention. Um, and that is primarily due to the growth of customers that we've won in the past as they as they scale up. So as they're you know expanding the use of the product on you know increasing the number of seats, we've seen significant growth with some of those. An example is Tepco in Japan, where they increased their usage from four thousand users to fourteen thousand users for for our disaster response um, offering. Um, I mentioned it that one hundred and thirty three percent was a was an average. 140% uh, at the enterprise level. At the lower end of the market, what we call the velocity end, which is the tier three, tier four, we have a slightly higher churn of customers and the net retention rate there was 108%, but it, could, um, but it averages out at 133. You can see in the circle graphs below the uh, industry split. So we're sort of about 25% utilities and about 74% um, telco. So we're including private networks in the, in the telco figure there. And then on, on a geographical split, where 74% of our revenues come from North America, 18% from EMEA, and 8% from APAC, which includes Japan. Um, as Richard mentioned, we've opened an office in Japan very recently, uh, sorry, in Kuala Lumpur very recently, and we would expect that to grow, um, you know, going forwards into 24 and 25, as we would expect the percentage coming from EMEA to grow as well as, you know, the Comsoft business has been really successful and we're starting to get a really strong foothold in, in the EMEA region. Okay, so just some... Um, financial performance KPIs, uh, focusing mainly on our recurring revenue. Um, so our, our exit annual recurring revenue um, increased by 41% to 21.3 million pounds. So this is the sort of entry run rate of recurring revenues that we will see in our P&L as, as we go into 2024. Um, in 2023, our in-year recurring revenues were up by 48% to 15.7 million pounds. Um, and our recurring revenue order intake was up by 17% to £25.7 million. Pounds. That £25.7 million is included in the total order intake of £57.2 million, which is up by 39%. That includes not only recurring revenue, but services, and then also software licenses and demand points. And then our, so overall, our total revenue grew by 67% to £44.5 million, and, and organically, 64%. So if we strip out the, the sort of the impact of Comsof, um, that was obviously all the way through 2023 and, and from August 2022, our organic growth rate was 64%. Um, on the gross margin, so we've had an uptick in our gross margins and we think we've reached the bottom of so we've gone through the bottom of the gross margin trough. Um, the reason it decreased from 64 to 59% between 21 and 22 was really the growth in, in services. So um, we've, we've really scaled the services organization. We're actually achieving in the second half of 2023, we achieved about 25% gross margin on services. Um, and I expect that will you know, continue as a, as a, at a higher gross margin as we go into 24 and 25. Um, we also think our service revenues, for reasons I'll, we'll come on to, will plateau at about 19, between 19 and 20 million pounds in 2024. Um, and that will allow, as we continue to win recurring revenue and more licenses, which carry between sort of 85 and 90% gross margin, we're going to see more um, revenue falling through to the bottom line uh, and the gross margin line, and therefore our gross margin should increase quite, quite substantively. We've seen some really good adjusted EBITDA coming through, um, so operational gearing, so that 67% top line growth has resulted in 247% uh, adjusted EBITDA growth. We've 
continue to win new logos. So it's not about just expanding the current logos, but we're also actively seeking out new logos. We acquired 64 new logos in 2023. Uh, we had a really good cash performance. Um, aging of, of receivables has significantly improved. And we ended up with 11 million pounds of cash on the balance sheet uh, at the end of the year, which I will, I'll, I'll come on to later on. Um, I'll also look at the further breakdown of uh, employees, but again, we're you know we're continuing to invest in sales and marketing, engineering, all all uh, aspects of the business across all regions, and our headcount was up to two hundred and seventeen as of thirty first of December. Um, I think I've touched on most of the key points on this side. Summary P and L, so you can see that you know the growth of sixty seven percent in our top line revenues. Um, Gross profit was obviously up by 70%, 26.7 million, achieving 60% gross margin. And our adjusted EBITDA was up by 247% so um, to 6.6 .6 million. Just a little bit of a, more of a breakdown on our revenue summary. So recurring revenues there, 15.7 million, up by 48%. Uh, perpetual software. That can be quite lumpy at times, but we, we did a, a good volume of that in 2023, 4.4 .4 million, which was up by 283%. Uh, demand points is that consumption-based usage I talked about for the uh, for the Comsoft product. And if you, you recall that we acquired Comsoft in August 2022, so that 3.4 million in 2022 is just a sort of the, a few months worth of, of revenue. Um, what we're trying to do is change the the mix from a more of a, a demand point basis to building the Comsoft sale of the Comsoft product in as a subscription. So we we actually quite successful at that in 2023. We signed 2.2 million pounds worth of Comsoft as a subscription in the year, but we still had 4.9 million of, of, of demand points um, that you can see in the PL. And then services. Good growth in services. You know, this is just due to the implementations that we're doing on the large tier one, tier two customers, and we've won quite a few. We've got some big implementation products uh, projects ongoing, so we've seen some good growth there. But as I said, I expect that services to plateau out between the nineteen and twenty million pounds as we go into twenty four and, and and beyond. I'll now hand back over to Richard, who's going to take us through some industry drivers and the opportunity we have. In the two verticals that we serve, um, one of the reasons uh, we're excited about uh, what we're doing is because of the really strong macroeconomic tailwinds that are driving um, both uh, markets. Um, so first of all, some sizing information. Uh, the addressable market we serve is, uh, we value at three billion uh, uh, pounds a year expressed as a recurring figure. Uh, now, this is a, a bottom-up calculation we've made, and fundamentally what we do is we uh, look at the number of firms we can target in, in the three regions we operate in. We classify those by size, and we multiply each of those by uh, the maximum potential recurring revenue we could get if we sold them everything. Um, when we look at the market this way, we see that the telecoms market is worth about uh, £600 million uh, pounds per year, expressed as a recurring figure. Um, and uh, what we also see is that the uh, utilities market is now worth 2.4 um, uh, billion uh, pounds a year expressed as a recurring figure. Uh, for those of you that have seen this slide before, um, the total addressable market uh, has gone up. And that's really because of the innovation we're making with our cloud-based product line, uh, which we think will give us access to a larger market, particularly uh, in Southeast Asia. I spoke of headway, um, tailwinds in each of the two markets we serve. Um, in telecoms, uh, what we've seen over the last uh, few years is very substantial uh, capex investments into fiber. Uh, fiber is the new generation of technology for broadband operators, uh, and it's proven a hit with uh, consumers and all broadband operators around the world. Uh, if they're not already 100% fiber, are upgrading their networks and extending their networks to be that fiber. Uh, sometimes investors ask us um, how much runway is left uh, in this market because the fiber story is, is, uh, is recent, but it's not new. And uh, here's some, here some data that we use to uh, explain the headroom that's still left. 
So yes, there are countries around the world like uh, Japan, like uh, Portugal and Spain, where fiber to the home penetration levels are quite high. Um, but if you look at the averages across the large economies, such as uh, Germany, UK, United States, what we see is that fiber to the home penetration levels are actually quite low. What we present here is 2022 data. So clearly in 23, there's been progress, um, but really, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, we are not exceeding 50% penetration levels. And so there's a lot of work still to be done on each of these markets. On utilities, um, uh, the trend we tap into is um, the evolution of current electricity grids uh, to being smart electricity grids. And so what this means is that uh, grid operators are deploying much, much more software into these grids, including um, system like ours. But the important question is, why, why uh, do uh, grid operators have to evolve to smart grids at all? And on the left here, you can see uh, a series of uh, really uh, substantial um, drivers that are forcing this transition to smart grids. Probably the most transformative one uh, is uh, the need to decarbonize power sources for the grid. Most of this is regulatory driven and we see regulatory shifts in North America and in Europe in particular. Decarbonization forces grid operators to move to intermittent energy sources and away from constant energy sources or, or controllable energy sources. And so with this uh, intermittency, uh, we have uh, much more complex operating cycles and much more complex forecasting cycles, which force grids to be much more agile and resilient and therefore to be smart. The second driver we're seeing uh, towards uh, smart grids is climate change. And what I mean by this really is uh, freak weather events, which are now becoming very common occurrence, particularly in North America and, and Asia, where uh, what we call, what the industry term, billion dollar storms are now becoming a very regular occurrence. And when these hit um, mainland uh, territories, they cause an extensive amount of damage to uh, infrastructure and to grids, and they cause uh, blackouts and um, uh, extensive economic damage. So grid operators are being forced by regulators to strengthen their grids, uh, underground them, uh, to make them more resilient, uh, to make them uh, redundant and self-healing. So all, this is also driving change. And the last driver, and uh, a very important driver, is age of infrastructure. Um, uh, transmission lines are aging rapidly uh, in, in our main markets in North America. Uh, average transition lines are over 25 years old, which means there's a lot out there that's older than 25 years old, and this needs replacing. And in Europe, uh, average age is even higher. Um, grid operators, unlike telecoms, um, do not build new grids and turn old ones off. Uh, they replace what they have in place. And so this combination of drivers is causing an incredible amount of uh, work for these operators, uh, great complexity and all of this needs managing and, and all of that creates opportunities for us. In both telecoms and in utilities, um, uh, both private uh, money is and public money uh, is being is being brought to finance these transformations. Uh, on the utility side, uh, we have some data here showing that over $150 billion worth of public money will be made available for grid uh, decarbonization uh, across in our main markets uh, uh, from now up to 2030. So that again represents an opportunity for us. So just a little bit more on that uh, total addressable market. You can see here that we, as, as Richard, I think has already said, we segment it into telcos, which is smaller, at 0 0.6 billion uh, pounds per year, expressed as an annual recurring figure, and utilities, which is by far the larger of the two, at 2.4 billion pounds per year, expressed as an annual recurring figure. Um, there are differences. I mean, telco is obviously, uh, especially with fiber rollout, is the market that is moving quickest at the moment. And we've got far, far more share of the the customer numbers and the um, and, and the revenue. Um, so we we segment them into four tiers. So that tier one and two, there's actually relatively few customers uh, in that top those top two tiers. It's the likes of the AT and T, Brightspeed, uh, Deutsche Telekom, you know, Openreach, etc. In the UK, um, 
and then there's but there's there's a whole volume of, of smaller tier three and tier four private network operators so that we we estimate there's about thirteen thousand seven hundred in that uh, in the bottommost tier and with our product now especially with the addition strategy we've got the ability to, to go after that sort of um, smaller base which we did also have before with the, with the ospi product but now at least it's all on one um, code platform um, with the utility sector there are more tier ones and twos so for example in the united states there's likely to be a utility per state um, and there's sort of but there's there's a slightly higher number in that, that top tier there's a bigger middle band but there's quite a few there's relatively fewer um, tier three tier four operators in the in the utility market our our product um, is designed to digitize the network life cycle so the network life cycle is all of those activities uh, that take a network whether that's a telecoms network or a an electricity network or a water network from the planning phases right the way through to um, being a live asset that is generating revenue um, our big idea was to uh, enable all of these functions on a, on, a, on, a, on a single platform. And the reason this was important is because what we observed um, in our customer base before uh, we launched our product was that customers were buying point solutions and then trying to integrate them themselves. Um, uh, this home-baked integration created very significant inefficiencies in, in, in our customers, uh, not least of which were data silos, um, broken workflows, uh, data problems, um, but this really came to a head when um, uh, our customers saw the opportunity to uh, invest in fiber in, in the telco market or, or upgrade their grids in, in the electricity market and started dramatically increasing uh, the throughput of work through these digital life cycles. And what we have seen consistently uh, across our markets is that when you try to scale up the amount of work your staff are doing, the, amount, the number of activities, uh, the amount of data that these digital uh, life cycles are trying to process, if you don't have an integrated solution, that volume of work very quickly turns into a backlog of work. And uh, very quickly, organizations start missing uh, their rollout targets, their construction targets, their performance targets, and their service quality targets. So by bringing all of these functions together, what we actually do is we, we put our customers back in control of their operations. We allow them to prioritize their resources and their activities correctly, and we enable them to meet their, uh, their business goals. Our product has three logical components. Uh, the first is a digital twin, uh, which is a, uh, a, a, the asset register of what's on the network. And it's extremely important that the asset register is high availability, in other words, available for everyone, that it is complete, and that it is current. So this is the first and most important working, uh, working component of our solution. The second solution is digital tools that we provide for each department to help them do their work uh, more accurately and faster. And a great example of that is the Comsoft product that Hayward mentioned, which is the market leader in automated design. It does the work of thousands of designers in hours, it does it to a higher quality standard, and it does it to a to the tune of a four to ten percent savings on the actual cost of the network that is that is built out. So a very, very powerful automation solution. The third component we provide is workflow. Workflow is the lifeblood of these organizations because uh, they have so many individuals. Uh, and so many touch points to the network, so many activities uh, within the organization. And uh, all of this needs coordinating. And by far the best way to do that is with workforce management solutions and workflows that allow organizations to construct um, uh, and articulate the way they want things done with the right forms, with the right information, and to uh, bring a, a high level of control and visibility over all these activities. Uh, so workflow is what pulls it all together. The solution is packaged appropriately for each of the two verticals that we uh, go after. Um, the, our two solutions are the integrated network, 
uh, for telecom operators and adaptive grid uh, for electric uh, utilities. Um, they share 90% of uh, the same code, um, but each, of, each one of them has specific modules and specific capabilities um, for, each, uh, for each vertical. And uh, that is important because uh, each vertical is, uh, views their own processes and requirements as, as unique, and, and, and therefore we have to provide the right solution for that. Um, I talked earlier about uh, our product offering uh, various advantages over our competition. So our global competition uh, can be characterized as uh, being of the same generation. Um, most, of their, most of these products uh, came out of the 1990s and they were good technology for their time, but fundamentally they are pre-cloud uh, technology. And being pre-cloud uh, means that they are uh, much harder to implement, they're much harder to, uh, to install, um, and therefore the time to value for these customers, for, for any customers looking at this technology is much longer. Um, and typically these solutions lack native mobility. And what that means is that the mobile application is a separate application. Um, and, it, and in general, customizing these solutions takes uh, much, much more time. So with our solution, um, the, uh, the implementations go much faster. Mobility comes out of the box with the core product. Uh, it means that uh, customers can get live faster. Uh, they can customize the product faster. And as their needs and requirements evolve over time, uh, they can shape the solution better uh, to their requirements. Oh, apologies. We often get asked if our solution uh, uses uh, AI. Um, and the answer is it does. It uses analytical AI, not generative AI. And we use it in two areas. The first is uh, for reducing costs. And I mentioned earlier, the Comsoft product is a very significant uh, uh, time saver and saver of labor and man hours. Uh, so this is an analytical engine that, that uh, replicates the behavior of humans and in fact is uh, better and faster than the behavior of humans for network design. Um, so saving man hours is, is a very, very important uh, driver for telecoms. They all of them are looking to become more efficient in what they do. And uh, one of the easiest ways to do that is to automate tasks and, and require fewer hands and, and heads to, to do those things. Uh, the second uh, really important area we uh, use AI in is in uh, helping our customers generate more revenue from their networks. A lot of our customers have spent significant amounts of money upgrading their networks and converting them to fiber. Uh, and uh, here, our product helps them um, find new customers and sell to new customers once those investments have been made. So this is a sales enablement tool. We call it a Network Revenue Optimizer. And it, and it performs two functions. It helps prospect uh, these customers by overlaying uh, potential customer information uh, over the, uh, the geospatial uh, views of, of the network and helps target them. And most importantly, it helps uh, sales teams generate quotes uh, in real time. And this really matters uh, because once you, uh, once these uh, sales teams have found a customer that wants to be connected to the grid and wants to take the services from these telecoms, it's really important that these quotations are turned around quickly because it is a competitive scenario. And if you take too long to provide them a quote, uh, there is a serious risk that they will take uh, their business somewhere else. So being able to provide quotes quickly um, translates directly to a higher win rate. So these are two areas where we're using AI uh, and both of these products are live and, and doing very well. And uh, in the future, we will also be developing use cases around uh, predictive maintenance, predictive outages and uh, data correction. So there's a lot of things we will be doing uh, with AI in the future. So we've talked about the addition strategy um, with sort of the, the, the lower end, with the simplest product being um, fully hosted. So that is multi-tenant SaaS. We use AWS as our, as our partner for that in all the regions in which we 
we operate. Um, we can also supply the the enterprise level product as either hosted um, uh, hosted solution. Again, we use partners there that you can see on this slide in that middle section, or we can provide it as an on premise solution um, for our customers if they want to host it again with those partners or indeed in their own data center um, if, if they wish so. So that's sort of the the different hosting options that we that we offer. Um, and as Richard has already said, the product is cloud native, so it scales up very quickly if there's an increase in processing, and it also can scale down very quickly if there's a decreasing in processing as different numbers of users um, come on and, and use the product. And it does scale very linearly, and we've tested it up to about 100,000 concurrent users. Um, We've mentioned several times of the 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 way we've segmented the product to operate at different tiers. Um, it's something we believe that our competition they can you know some of our competition can operate at the very top end, but you know the, their products are quite complex. It doesn't scale down to the tier three and tier four levels. Uh, we can do that, and we do do that. So we offer that insight product for the tier three and tier fours. And then at the top end, we um, we can use uh, our professional and enterprise level products. And we're starting to work with um, system integrators, which I'll come on to my next slide, to help scale the, the business and accelerate the growth in revenue and margins. So how we go to market in different regions does vary. Uh, North America, we've got about 64, 65 people in the sales team as at the 31st of December. And of those, we're about 40 in North America. So that's the US and Canada. And we mainly have a direct to uh, customer relationship in, in, in the North American region. In Europe, predominantly due to sort of the, the number of countries we, we can, could operate in, we, we operate through a mix of direct sales team and uh, partners. Uh, in the Nordics and Africa and uh, the Middle East, we mainly go through a, a partner focus, just again, purely because of the sort of the quick uh, speed to market and, and trying to, um, you know, uh, put the product into, product into as many countries as possible. In uh, APAC, um, we've just opened an office in Kuala Lumpur, and we think there's considerable opportunities in countries like Indonesia, the fifth most populous country in the world, as they, as they start to roll fiber out, uh, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, um, et cetera. So again, we will look to partner there to, to again, speed of access uh, into those countries. And in Japan, where we've operated for a number of years, we just partner, use partners, uh, predominantly NEC is our main partner in that, in that country. Um, we've got a number of really good use cases here, some really good logos. Um, you know, and, and I think the, the overall message here, if you read this and have got access to it, that we make their operations much more efficient. So if you look at AT&T, it's reducing their construction times by over 20%. Um, if you look at Bell, we've reduced 10,000 man hours in manual processing, which is saving them a whole load of money. It basically enables them to do more with the same uh, number of staff that they have. Uh, Brightspeed, where we're, you know, they're building a fiber only network and rolling that out. Um, and with our fiber planning engine, they're saving hundreds of millions of dollars in costs and reducing time to market by up to four weeks, which is when there's a sort of a competitive fiber landscape is, is very important. Um, and so on and so on. And, you know, it's not just in North America. We've got Deutsche Telekom who use the soft product. And on the utility side here, we've got some really good use cases. Uh, Tepco in Japan, um, uh, use, they've increased the number of pro uh users of the product from 4,000 to over 14,000 users in 2023. Um, again, enabling them to do their recovery work much more efficiently. So that increase in users, uh, because we sell on a per seat per module basis, that's something we, you know, the customers can absolutely do with us. And that gives us that great net retention rate of 133% that I, I, I mentioned earlier. So just a little bit more on some of the detailed financials. Uh, our cash flow, we were really pleased with the cash flow this year. You can see 6.5 million pounds of operating cash flow prior to working capital in 2023. Uh, we've had another year of positive working capital movement, which has accelerated from 1 million pounds in 2022 to 2.9 million pounds in 2023. And that's not, not to be unexpected because you know we're, we're growing and with our subscription revenues, we invoice annually in advance. 
Um, so I would expect there to be a continued positive working capital movement as we go into 23, uh, sorry, 2024 and 2025. Taxes received, uh, 0.5 million is from our uh, R&D tax credits that we get. We have got um, multi-million pounds, we've got about 20 million pounds of tax losses, um, and we continue to use those, but I expect that the amount we receive back to, um, to cease in 2024, and we'll just use those losses and try and roll them forward instead. Um, we paid the first the 1.3 million pounds uh, is the first deferred consideration for the Comsoft business. Um, and the, the second 1.3 million, there were two earnouts effectively. And the second 1.3 million pounds will be paid on the 27th of March. So in uh, uh, five days time. Um, and yeah, when we're really pleased to pay it because that business has done really, really well. Um, and we've got a really good uh, European base now as well. Just on terms of our balance sheet, obviously our, con our intangible assets continue to grow. Uh, we're in, you know, that includes our um, capitalized software uh, and we continue to um, obviously invest. We're investing about 14% of our gross revenues in, in R&D and that's a figure we will look to continue to maintain as we go forwards. Uh, trade and other receivables are up um, as you would expect in a growing business. Um, the aging has actually improved significantly from 2022. So if you look at the more detailed information in the stats, it gives the aging profile. That has uh, significantly improved. We're really pleased with the performance on that. Um, trade and other payables has also increased. That's mainly the deferred revenue. Um, as I said earlier, we invoice annually in advance and there's a deferred element that goes onto the, onto the balance sheet. Deferred contingent, contingent consideration is the final 1.3 million of the... Um, the Comsoft earnout, and then we've got some other other items in that balance sheet. But hopefully, that gives you enough explanation. Just a little bit on our headcount. Continue to grow the employees. Um, we do invest a lot, you know, a lot in our employees. We're really pleased. We've got a, a low churn level around ten percent, which is very good for the for the industry. Um, and we've got a very positive uh, ENPS score as well. So plus thirty five is our is our group ENPS score. Um, and, you know, attracting talent in this environment is really hard, so we're really pleased that you know, everybody is um, seems to be very happy and I think we're a good company to work for. You can see here the uh, the split of the uh, the employees. So we've got, we've increased the number of technical consultants over, num that's our implementation staff and professional services staff. They've more than doubled since 2021, going from 34 to 80. We've increased sales and marketing from 35 to 65 over that same sort of two year period. Um, our engineering department, again, more than double, going from 21 to 50. And then we've also invested in the administration functions of the business as we grow. And just in terms of location, um, we've got a got a, a split there. So 53 people in the UK, 45 in Europe, predominantly in the in Belgium and in Ghent. And then in the Americas, we've got 111, which is split approximately 70. Um, well, it, it's actually about 100 in the in the US and about 11 in uh, in Canada. And then we've got the Asia um, employees as well, which has increased mainly through the opening of the Kuala Lumpur office. That's it in terms of the uh, slideware. So, if there are any questions, well, there, there are some questions, David. So, oh, I haven't seen uh, them. Yeah, they're on the uh, they're on the chat page. So, we promised okay. uh, fifteen minutes of questions, uh, which we're going to do now. Uh, so, what I'll do, um, Howard, is I'll I'll go to each question and then either keep it or give it to you. Okay. So we'll do them in the order they were submitted. Uh, so we have a pre-submitted question here. First of all, congratulations on the results. Thank you very much. Um, if the company continues to grow at this pace, do you foresee starting dividend payments in the next 18 months? I think I know the answer to this, but I'm, I'm going to hand it to you. Uh, anyway. Yeah, um, not in the next 18 months. I mean, you know, we, we've got such a, we want to continue to invest that cash uh, in, in um, you know, in uh, growing the business. I think there's a lot more, we've shown there's a huge addressable market and we would like to um you know chase that as much as possible so i think uh, investing in r d investing in sales is something we really want to do and you know our product set is pretty complete but 
we you know we would always consider further m a i think we've been very good with the m a we've done we've bought um you know some good really good companies and we've integrated them really well and i think we've got a good track record and we could do that again there are certain specific products out there that we would look at things like workforce management um because again we sell a lot of mobile licenses so um, we don't foresee paying any dividend payments in the next 18 months. Okay. Next question. Uh, one of our board members uh, sold shares to help introduce an institutional investor. Can we say anything about uh, levels of institutional interest? Do you want to take that, Hill? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, we, we've seen... You'd have all seen the increase in the share price. We've got some new institutions coming on uh, quite recently. Um, and I think as we go through, we grow and our market cap grows, um, we sort of start to attract other, you know, new institutions who probably wouldn't have looked at us before and become more interesting for them. Um, so we've seen a lot of interest. I think that's sort of helped the growth in the share price. Um, yeah, so I, th I think there is renewed interest in us out there. Well, and and a lot of the institutional investors uh, that we brought in over the last 18 months, many of them are starting with much smaller positions than they would like. So mm -hmm. they've got a toehold uh, in the business. And uh, what we see them doing is, uh, you know, hoovering up uh, shares as they become available in order to build up a position. Yeah. Uh, so there's uh, the quite constant uh, appetite for our shares is what we've seen. Yes. Uh, next question, um, can we elaborate on the initiatives IQGEO is undertaking to further enhance SaaS-based revenue model and its impact on long-term financial stability? Uh, so two-part question there, I'll do the first part. Um, so the, the most important activity we've undertaken as it relates to our SaaS-based product um, is, is what we term packaging. And what this means is it, it, it's all about creating a self-service model for our customers. Um, the, um, uh, so what this means is that the product uh, comes pre-configured using uh, best practice in the market. It comes with data loaders that customers can use to migrate their data into the product. And uh, on the professional version of the product, it comes with configuration tools that allow customers to do some light configuration of the product, no code configuration of the product. Um, uh, to suit it to their needs, particularly around things like workflows. The other things we're doing is we're investing in training programs, uh, training videos, uh, libraries, uh, expertise, etc. So all of this is designed to create um, a self-service product uh, so that uh, customers can get up and running quickly so that it has a really good time to value and doesn't require uh, expensive services. The uh, commercial advantage of this uh, is that A, that we can uh, continue selling subscriptions without having to uh, continually invest in services to deliver these products. And so this is one of the reasons Hayward mentioned that our services um, forecast is, is flatlining. The second advantage of this strategy is that it really helps our channel partners uh, uh, drive more product. Uh, so um, the additions product line is ideal for resellers. Uh, this, these are uh, partners in the industry who don't have professional services capabilities. Um, so it's a, an easy product to demonstrate and, and sell. And the product uh, also uh, lends itself to much larger um, uh, uh, types of channel partners, so uh, what we call integrators. Um, a lot of the work we're doing to render the product ideal for SaaS also involves simplifying uh, the way the product is uh, configured and the way it's extended uh, through use of APIs and, and other tools. And so all of that work, uh, in addition to making our product better for SaaS, will also make our product better for large channel partners. And what that means is that uh, they will be able to distribute the product and, and generate you know, services revenue off that, and therefore that increases the likelihood that they will recommend our products at tier one accounts and tier two accounts. Do you want to take the financial angle of that question, Howard? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you know, the as as we the the services revenue sort of plateaus, um, we're naturally going to get more of that SaaS based revenue on a recurring basis, and with an increase in recurring from thirty five percent, we you know we expect over the 
mid to long term, that should grow towards a 70% recurring uh, uh, you know, uh, level, which is proper, you know, it'll be a, a really good software company metric. Um, if we can get 70% 70, 70 recurring, obviously, that will give us much better visibility. Uh, we're already starting to get that much better visibility, you know, as we do more and more recurring revenue, but it would give us an increased uh, you know, visibility and then for and therefore you know, become more stable. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, from Colin: How is IQ Geo positioning itself to leverage uh, the forty billion fund for uh, high-speed internet uh, announced by Joe Biden? Yes. So, uh, so um, the Biden government have set aside very significant funds, part of it under the BEAD program, and part of it under uh, the kind of the economic reconstruction program. Um, so the way these programs work is that money is allocated uh, to the state level and then uh, at e in each state, um, uh, um, uh, uh, telecoms companies um, are invited in to bid uh, on certain areas of the state that, that has low broadband um, penetration and then, that, and then that money is awarded to the best bid. Uh, and so many of our customers in North America are bidding on these um, uh, on these projects and they use our software to do that. So they use the Comsoft suite uh, to design uh, what the network will look like. And then they use the IQ Geo network to the IQ Geo product to plan it and to package it up into um, uh, into uh, work parcels. So our solution gets used to make these bids. And then when these bids are won by our customers, um, they, that work is then executed um, inside our suite. So we're right at the center of that, um, and we're helping our customers win those, um, uh, win those competitions. Uh, next question. Um, can you speak to uh, the pl platform resilience and cybersecurity? So, um, uh, uh, yes, we invest heavily in cybersecurity. We want to make sure that our products are um, safe uh, to use. I will emphasize that our, uh, our product is not designed to contain very sensitive information. So we never hold client data, personal data, credit card data or anything like that. But nevertheless, we want to make our product secure. And so our CTO um, is, uh, uh, has a whole program to make sure that we are discovering by vulnerabilities uh, in the product we use, penetration testing, things like that, and making sure that these are properly um, prioritized. Um, the other thing I'll say is that uh, as a business, we're uh, ISO 2000... 27001. 27001 compliant. 27, compliant. Uh, so that was a big program we undertook internally. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that makes sure that as a business, uh, we are run uh, very, very safely. We're conscious uh, about cybersecurity threats. We train our staff uh, on this uh, all the time, and we require quite high levels of uh, certification there. Uh, and of course, all of that flows through to the work we do um, with our customers. In terms of resilience, Hayward already mentioned, we, we volume test our product uh, to much, much higher levels than, than is needed by our customers. Um, that includes both um, uh, performance in terms of uh, data and user scalability, uh, and also in terms of uh, resilience and, and, and its ability to um, uh, remain stable. Uh, th this is important. We are a mission critical system. And so the stability matters uh, hugely to our customers. Uh, next question. Um, uh, we're opening an office in Kuala Lumpur and expanding an APAC. What challenges do we anticipate in these new markets? Well, the, the, the key differences we see in those markets compared to the traditional markets we operate in is that um, for many of these countries, uh, the whole business of designing and rolling out um, a, uh, a fiber solution is quite new to them. Um, and so uh, they don't have the, uh, the experience uh, that we've seen that we see in more mature markets. And therefore they, have, they also have less experience on the processes and procedures they need to do that. And of course, in all of the systems supporting that. So the most important thing we've done, and I already mentioned is that we've created products that have best practice baked in uh, so that they don't have to think about how they ought to be doing things it's kind of presented to them in the product and we make the product easy to use and easy to deliver to themselves uh, so that uh, to cater for the fact that they don't have large experienced IT teams. So we think these two products, uh, the additions, uh, the uh, the insight and professional versions of the product 
absolutely ideal for this market. And uh, since opening Kuala Lumpur, you know, we've seen the pipeline grow very quickly there. And uh, we've seen a lot of uh, interest from prospective customers. Uh, last two questions. Thank you for providing the TEPCO example, scaling from 4K to 14K. Can you give an example of similar scaling within uh, Telco? Uh, yeah, yeah, please, yeah. Yes, I mean, we've got a um, not quite to 14,000 users, but um, we're sort of maybe on the way towards that. Um, so AT&T was a you know, big customer we signed uh, 18, just over 18 months ago. And um, they started off with 250 users of our of, of the system as they started the sort of initial deployment. And then there was a, so the way that AT&T are rolling out fiber is that they'll do it sort of state by state, effectively or city by city. And as they go through that rollout, they will then increase the number of users and the sort of the uh, demand points that they're taking as well, because they're using the, the fiber planning engine. So at the end of 2023, they went from 250 users up to 2000 users. And there's, you know, I would say they're probably a third of the way through the rollout. So there's a, a significant amount to come uh, with that as well. You know, so we can see, you know, that will build itself into the financials in terms of more recurring revenue. We set out very clearly at the start of the contract, um, the price points of each of these sort of scaling opportunities. Um, so we've got, we know that, you know, what potentially what will happen is just the, the speed of that rollout that will dictate um, exactly when that happens. Okay, thank you. Last last question. Uh, give the opportunity for future acquisitions. Do you envisage issuing uh, further to shares to fund? And if so, will private investors be able to participate? Yes, we can take that. Yeah, so I mean, uh, it, it, it really depends on the size of the acquisition. Um, the last two, we, we did issue uh, shares to fund those acquisitions, but they were relatively small. Um, but then we weren't cash generative and we, you know, we couldn't get any bank borrowing because we weren't producing any cash. Now we are producing cash and we've got 11 million pounds on the balance sheet. Um, again, it depends on the size of the organization. If it was the size of the ones we've done in the past, we'd probably just do it through debt or, or cash even. Um, if it was larger, then we would have to issue some some shares. Um, I don't quite know right at this point whether we'd, um, you know, how we'd do it. We would definitely do it obviously to institutions um, and, and current uh, current shareholders, but it might be uh, appropriate at the time to open it up to um, you know other other private investors as well. So we might be able to set a portion aside and do that. But I think that's something we'd have to assess at a point in time. Very good, thank you. So we've come to the end of the questions, and I think we've come to the end of our hour just in time. Um, uh, just in closing, I'd like to say that um, you know we're we're very excited about the opportunity ahead of us. Uh, there's a lot of momentum uh, in the markets that we serve. Uh, the organization is uh, energized. Uh, we have very high uh, employee net promoter score uh, levels, which tells us we're doing the right things from an organizational perspective. And like I said in, in the annual report, you know, we really feel that the planets have aligned for us. Uh, we have strong tailwinds in our markets. We think our product uh, is, has the right combination of new technology and proven performance. Uh, we have a great team uh, operating globally, and we feel we have an edge uh, over competitors. Uh, so for us, uh, the future is very bright. And I think with that, I'll hand it back to our uh, friends uh, at uh, um, Company Meet. At Company Meet. Thank you. Richard Hayward, thank you for updating investors today. Can I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of IQGO Group PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.